Uh, now to the main event. I'm honored that our first speaker of the year is a person who is well known to many of us. Arvind Navabi was born in Iran in 1983 and attended the University of Tehran. But, before, but living under an Islamic theocracy was not for him. In 2004, he left Iran and settled in Vancouver, studying finance at the University of British Columbia, and has lived there since then. In 2012, Armin founded the international uh, atheist community called Atheist Republic, with consulates or branches in many cities around the world, which includes Toronto. Atheist Republic has over 86,000 members. Armin also wrote, uh, wrote a book published in 2014, Why There Is No God. Then in uh, January 2017, Armin started a podcast with Ali Rizvi, Faisal Saeed al Matar, and Yasmin Muhammad called Secular Jihadists from Middle East, which has since been renamed uh, uh, Secular Jihadists for Muslim Enlightenment uh, in 2018, which is now co hosted by Armin and Ali Rizvi. Ali is here, and uh, or he will be here soon. And there is talk that there might be a podcast in the works, but I'm not sure if that has been decided or not. So, folks, please give a hand to Armin. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, there you go. That's it, yeah. All right. You've heard this before, so bear with me. He doesn't. So. Okay, so... When I was still living in Iran, I remember online I discovered this letter. It was a letter directed at Ayatollah Khamenei, which is the supreme religious leader in Iran. And this was a letter that was very critical of him, very, very openly criticizing him. It was written by somebody, an Iranian outside of Iran, but still for me, this was revolutionary for me, for me, somebody to be able to dare to openly criticize the supreme religious leader like that. For me, that, that, was, that was insane. I was like, this guy has balls. Um, just, to, just to make it clear why this was so significant, I was at that time an atheist, and I told some of my friends that, were, that I'm an atheist, I told my parents that I was an atheist, and this was somewhat risky, but not very risky because I wasn't openly announcing my atheism. But even among friends and family, we wouldn't be talking openly against Khamenei that much. That's a little bit too risky. Like most people's understanding is that well, in a country like Iran, it's probably God is like here, Muhammad is like here, and then you have the Imams, and then maybe you have Ayatollah Ali Khamenei somewhere down there as important and holy. But it's exactly the other way around, right? So you could. You know, we have a lot of people in Iran that maybe hate Islam, maybe a lot of people that don't believe in God, but even they are not comfortable, at, at least at that time, now things have changed, we're uncomfortable going around and saying, like, you know, fuck Khamenei or whatever like that. That would be like, yeah, a no go area. So for me, this letter was incredible. So I printed it, and I put it in my school bag. Oh, dear. And I, no, it didn't do, okay, it's not that as big of a deal as you think. I never took it out. I just went around the city and I just walked with it. And I was like, the entire time my heart was beating so fast. And I was just like, yes, I have this letter and these people have to, nobody knows that I have this letter. Like, if somebody discovers it, like, I would be in so much trouble. But I'm getting away with this. Like, I, I felt like I was doing some act of rebellion that I possess this letter. And people around me don't know, so I'm getting away with it. So it's kind of like a little bit of a freedom that you're trying to get, like because doing something that you're not supposed to do. And then I just, when I got back home, I just tore it down so many little pieces. I just tried to make sure even the sentences were being like torn in, and right in the middle of it, like so, so that if somebody discovers a piece of it, you can't read the entire sentence. And I didn't try to flush it down the toilet, and it wasn't flushing. I took it out, small pieces. <laughs> I put it back in, keep washing it, and I was like so scared. It was... But the reason why I tell the story is because another, I think it's the best way to show people what it feels like when you're living in a place where you can't just say whatever you want to say. Because I think a lot of people, when they're not born 
in an environment where they're not free to express their opinions, they don't really understand how important and how valuable it is. And I think they take it for granted. And when I when I first came to Canada, I just felt so relieved to be able to just say anything. I, was, I can say anything. Like I can say any opinion. I can just express it, and there's not going to be somebody tomorrow knocking at my door, coming and arresting. Like this is amazing. There's no opinion that the government will, is going to come after you for. And it just felt like this this eye, right? This this that you always feel behind your shoulder and just monitoring your every move it wasn't there anymore. It's just like it's just like, it just felt like it felt like you were free. So when the first time a couple of years ago when I started noticing there are these groups of people that are on our supposed to be on our side and they're introducing some red lines on things that you're not supposed to say. I felt like What's going on here? I mean, it's not that big of a deal. There's no laws, there's no major consequences. But it just didn't seem right. They're like, you can't say this, this is too offensive, this is not right, this is in poor taste, this is too aggressive to say. And I thought, like, okay, this is, this is not good. Like, this is, we're in Canada. Um, and I know it's not as big of a deal as a country like you're not even close, but it's just a mere introduction of it felt wrong to me. And I was like, okay, what are these? What are these things? I have to figure out what they are, so I can say them more. Because if you come here, I have to go say like I have to figure out what are exactly the things that are people are saying is too far. You, you cannot say it. There's the red lines. Like I need to find out what those are so we can say them more often. So I burned a Quran and I recorded it and I put it on YouTube. <laughs> and I lost, I lost, a, I lost a lot of my friends for that. A lot of people, even on my, like even the anti-Islamic, you know, ex-Muslim atheists, they're like, yeah, that was maybe a bit too far. I mean, uh, you know, we thought people are, were exaggerating when they were calling you Nazi, but now you're doing exactly what the Nazis used to do. You're burning books. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other reasons why they, they give me a lot of. They give me. A, I actually collected a list of all the reasons why I shouldn't burn the Quran, and I, I tried to address them all in the video. But anyway, what do you think is the main number one reason why I shouldn't be burning the Quran? Any guesses? Not you guys. Know. Why, why should or why should? Why shouldn't I? Like, what was the number one reason I got from people that why is that? Because people would fire me. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. Yeah. Carbon dioxide. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes! The number one complaint I got from my friends was do you have to add more carbon dioxide? <laughs> Some people were like, can you at least recycle the Quran? <laughs> Problem, including that, because if you watch the video, what I, when I start the video, the first thing I do is I show look, this is a donation by me to offset one ton worth of carbon emissions, which is way more than what I would produce from Mary Quran. So that was the first thing I said, and I put that out, out of the way. The second thing they said that this is hateful. So I burned my own book right next to the Quran to be like, if it's meant to be hateful, do I hate myself? Another thing I mentioned is that this is censorship. So I started in the video, you can see I showed to everybody, like, look, the Quran, there's so many free Quran apps on my phone. There's no way that people can't, don't have access to the Quran because of my Quran version. The Quran is available online on every app. Uh, they told me this is what the Nazis used to do. This is what fascists, they burn books. I'm like, well, they burn other people's books. This is my book. I paid for this book. This is my property. The, the whole purpose, the entire goal that they had was to get other people. That was books were the main sources of learning and education, right? They were trying to remove people's access to information. I'm not removing anyone's access to information by burning my own copy. In fact, I showed in the video that I have two other Qurans that were so pretty 
that I wasn't going to burn up. Those are expensive. I, I burned my cheapest Quran. <laughs> Look, I have these other Qurans. One of them was a rainbow Quran. I call it my gay Quran. And another one had like tafsir and everything on it. And I was so good. I like, look, I, I'm not even burning all my Qurans. I'm keeping these two and I like I like them. I'm not gonna burn them. Um but I still I still managed to lose a lot of friends. Most of them left for me, as you expect. But I also lose a lot of uh, right leaning friends of mine when I started defending ISIS members. And why did I, why were they defending ISIS members? Because there was this, this kangaroo court in Iraq where there was a whole bunch of ISIS um, prisoners that they were getting 20 minute, half an hour hearings, no lawyers, no due process, and they were a 20 minute hearing execution. Like one by one. A lot of them were just married to ISIS. They were, I don't even, nobody even, did any investigation if they did anything themselves at all. Nothing, no no defense, nothing. And I was, and I was, what the hell's going on here? Well, 20 minute hearing, this is a joke. And I was defending them. I was like, these are ISIS members. Yes, they're ISIS members, but they're captured. They don't have any weapons. They're not attacking anyone. They deserve legal protection. Um, and people are like, what the hell? I mean, you're an ISIS sympathizer now. You're defending <laughs> ISIS. Like, yeah, I'm defending ISIS. I'm defending human rights. So, and I lost a lot of people, friends on the right when I did that. But, and people think like, this is so weird. You're extremely on one side, you're anti-Islam, you're burning Quran, and now you're also defending ISIS members. Like, what the hell, like this, how could that happen at the same time? But I don't understand why, there's no contradiction here. Did, and do you see what, what the main theme here? It's enlightenment values, right? You believe in freedom of expression, you believe in due process. These are the ideas that came out of the Enlightenment and we, we, we support and we believe in because they work. They work, they worked for every nation, every society and every group of people that decided to use these values and apply them where they live. They became the most advanced countries in the world, they became the most progressive ones, they became the most uh, scientifically, you know, they, they managed to come up with the uh, most advanced technologies. And we, you know, when, the, when these ideas were first introduced, people relied on philosophy to say why these ideas are good. Now we don't have to do that anymore because now we have years worth of data to show that no, they work. We have, we have the science and the statistics and the numbers to show why these are the best values. So, and, and these are the values that are under attack by Every group, every group, uh, by Christians, by Muslims, by left wing, by right wing, and it's interesting because they attack them while also trying to claim credit for their their results. So the way Christians do that is that they say like, why are Western countries, for example, great? Is because of Judeo-Christian values. They are, these are these are the Judeo-Christian values that uh, freedom of expression and all. And I keep I keep asking them like, where is that? Show me in the Bible. I, like I have been asking Christians every time they say that Western countries are great because of Judeo-Christian values. Like show me in the Bible where is freedom of expression? Where is limited government? Where is due process? Ne <laughs> so far nothing. It, and, and it's interesting that. This is a very simple question. Show me where in the Bible is coming from. And even though I haven't gotten a, a single answer to that, they have managed to sell this idea. So many people believe that. So many, even so many very intelligent people believe that. The, the, the way Muslims, the Muslims are a little bit late on this game to claim credit for Judeo Christian, for enlightenment values, but they do it in a form of, you know, the Islamic reform thing, uh, which is a, the, the way they do it is to, to, to claim that these ideas. Are, have always been in the Quran. You just haven't been reading it right for 1400 years. All of these ideas were there, and now that the rest of the world has progressed and realized that, oh, these are shit ideas, they just realize now that they were, we were reading it wrong all this time, and they were always in agreement with the line of values. Okay, good luck with that. The way, the way right-wing people try to claim credit, again, Hashtag not all, not all left wing, not all right wing, you know? <laughs> but they, they don't even refer to them as enlightenment values, they refer to them as Western values. 
And the reason I have a problem with that is that, first of all, we don't like all Western values. Uh, we, Nazism is a Western value, right? Uh, communism, by you know, Marx and Germany, that's a Western value, I don't like that. There are some values that were popularized in the 1800s and 1700s in the West that we like. Not all of the Western values are great. And also, these, are, these, are, these values did become very popular because of some philosophers in France and in, uh, in England. But, but everywhere else that they were celebrated, they worked, right? They worked in Japan, they worked in South Korea, they worked in compare, uh, Hong Kong with China. Um, it, it, they just and they worked in Australia. They don't, it's not Western countries. They, these are, they, are, they work and they belong to the world. So the reason why I like to call them enlightenment values is because it's easier to sell them if you don't call them Western values. They don't belong to the West, they belong to the world. And the, the reason, another, but, but I think a lot of people, again, hashtag not all, a lot of people on the right when they say uh, Western values, it's not about celebration of certain ideas, it's about we are, these are, this is us, and this is what we came up with, and I, you know, they trying to create an identity based on these values, based on the countries that you live in, and try to say that this is why we're better than others. Right? So we claim you, they keep calling it Western values because they want to claim ownership over the progress that they make. And a lot of them actually don't even celebrate the values. They celebrate the fact that Western countries are becoming greater, but they don't even address what are those values. I mean, a lot of them, you know, don't, a lot of the enlightenment values that we celebrate, many of their values goes against them. But I won't get into that. But they just, claim credit for the result without actually celebrating the values themselves. But from all these other groups, what, what the main group that is going against the line of values, which is first the most, is the left. Okay? Because we expect conservatives not to be, I mean, historically, they're not very for accept tolerance. They're not known for that. You know? It was mostly the left that led women rights, gay rights, minority rights, transgender rights. Uh, you know, they were the leaders of championing enlightenment values. Um, Christians and Muslims, of course, they are right-wing ideologies. We don't expect them to be champions of enlightenment values. So it's with, and you know, coming out of Islam, Islam being a very right-wing ideology, you think that, okay, your natural allies are probably on the left. So you come in and you join them and you consider yourself a leftist. So that's, that's why it hurts the most yeah. when they betray enlightenment values. And they go after the most important one of all the values, which is the freedom of expression and fighting censorship. Because the reason why enlightenment values are many, but the reason why that's the foundation of all the other ones is because you need that one to be able to fight for the rest of them. Right? If you lose that, you lose all of them. And, and this is why it's, it's a huge betrayal. It's a huge betrayal. But now, a lot of people think, well, yeah, we, a lot of people from the left tell me, I mean, yes, I understand that we have a problem. There's some people on the left that are very, uh, have a sensorial attitude, call, the regressive left, what you call them, I don't know, you call them social justice warriors, you call them the cult of woke. Um, there are many, <laughs> there are many different names. But, but then they have a big of detail. They say, look, is this all right? You know, look at hate crimes. You know, it's not Antifa, it's mostly the right winger. They are doing the hate crimes. And that's, you know, and even globally, if you think about it, the rise of the alt right is not just the North American and Western European thing. Uh, right wingers are even are rise, becoming more influential in Israel than in India. There, right? So, so yeah, it's a problem, and it's not that big of a problem. But the reason why I think right now, at least, um, left wing censorship is a is a global problem, uh, and it could be even a bigger problem right now. Right now, historically, it's been uh, the right wing that has been the main, most uh, challenging one. But the reason why I think now it, the, the greatest threat is coming from the left is because even though they're a minority, they're a very loud minority, um, they happen to also 
be very influential in certain companies that decide what people get to say <coughs> on a global scale. And I'm talking about the, the culture, the, the philosophy that people have in one tiny little city, Silicon Valley, right? You have a company like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter yeah. that are based there. And that's why that philosophy of the people that live there influences the community standards of these com companies. And you have to understand that there are more people today talking on the platform of these companies more than any, the, the total number of people that are talking offline. Okay? So what they get, get to decide, what they allow us allow people to talk about, determines it's not it's not just a US left and right in politics. This is affecting activism in India. Activism in Indonesia, activism in Malaysia, activism in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan. I get letters from Twitter telling me that I broke Pakistani laws. I'm like, they're like, Twitter is telling me to lawyer up. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm in Canada. Why are you telling me, like, like Twitter, why is Twitter telling me about breaking Pakistani laws? Like, okay, tell me what are those Pakistani laws so I could break them more often. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm proud to be, be to be breaking Pakistani laws. But, but you can't, but there, a lot of people say, well, this is not, I mean, this is not a free speech issue, okay? This is not a free speech issue because Facebook is not the government. Twitter is not the government. YouTube is not the government. These are pri private platforms. They should be able to get to decide what you say and what you say. So yeah, they're not the government. And it's not a free speech issue. It's a censorship issue, okay? Um, so we, Atheist Republic was removed from Facebook so far three times. And we got back three times. I tell Christians that Jesus died and came back once. We did it three times so far. <laughs> but but it, is, it is not a violation of free speech because free speech is violated when the government limits your, your ability to express yourself. But it is censorship, even though it's not a violation of free speech. And it's still a really bad idea. And you have to, if you think about it, the reason why we have free speech laws, the reason why we have them is because governments were too, they had too much power and influence over what people got to say. So if, so if free speech laws made any sense, by the same logic, now we have certain companies that have even more influence than governments over what, get to peop what people get to say. So if we came up with free speech laws, now we need to come up with something new. I don't know what, but we need to come up with something new because, you know, for this, based on the same line of reasoning. So the, the tactics that are being used, again, I understand that enlightenment is under attack by all sides, but I also don't want to pretend that when, when I'm attacking, you know, left-wing censorship, that I, I'm not acknowledging the other side. Because I can tell you something. If if people, right now a lot of people, I follow a lot of people from the regressive left, from alt-right, I follow, I watch a lot of Islamic uh, YouTube channels, a lot of uh, Christian podcasts, so I try to keep an eye on everything. And I, I know that people from the alt-right, if right now they're saying free speech, free speech, but they themselves admit that they don't believe in free speech. Uh, they agree that if they were controlling social media, they would be even more censorial. Right? They say that free speech is a train that you ride on until you get to your destination, and then you remove it for everybody else. They admit that. So I'm not pretending like, oh, if the left is evil and all the alt-right is great. I know, I know that some of them say, like, listen, if we were in power, we would be shooting the people that we disagree with. And they say that. They, they don't know. Why is my YouTube channel or YouTube videos get removed? And this is still on, on, on YouTube. I don't understand. But they, um, so, but, they re but I'm dealing with the problem here and now. And this is a temporary problem when it comes to reversible. Because we have experience with this before. We, we have seen uh, something like this happen. You know the, the Red Scare? You guys know about the Red Scare? Right, okay. So 
the, what happened in the United States was people were being accused of being communists left and right, right? So you had, if you had a picture with this guy that was at this meeting, all of a sudden the government is investigating you like you might be a Russian spy or something, right? People were losing their jobs, FBI was investigating people. Um, I mean, that was even way worse uh, because at least now when people are being accused of being Nazis left and right, Nobody, the government is not involved, right? But that was a lot more scary than what we are experiencing now. But we look at, back at that right now and we think like, that was ridiculous. And I think it was very short, it got over, and I think we're gonna get over this right now as well. And it's very, the similarities are very interesting because um, if you look at what happened at that time, people thought, people were paranoid, they thought, the Soviet Union could come and take over the United States any day, like there's spies everywhere and there, there's a risk at uh, them taking over. Just like there's a paranoia over Nazism apparently making a comeback right now and the alt-right and white supremacists. But we know now, if you look at the Soviet Union's power at that time, based on every historical analysis, that they were not ever in a position to topple you know, the government of the United States. That was like fear-mongering. Um, and another interesting similarity is that there were actually spies in Russian spies in the United States at that time, and this whole fear mongering against, uh, um, against the Soviet Union helped them. Helped them go under the radar. And just like right now, um, everybody is left and right being accused of being bigots or Nazis, diet Nazi apparently, um, <laughs> and white supremacists, that the, that, the, that the real white supremacists and right wing uh, alt right people, they're benefiting from it because. They, I actually, when you actually now find a real racist and you point out that oh, this motherfucker is a racist, we're like, well, everywhere is a racist these days. Like, no, this guy is an actual racist. Like, this guy is an actual racist. <laughs> like, you can't, that, it, it has lost its thinking power, right? Because it has been so overused yeah. that now you can't actually even identify. It's, it's so sad because racism is huge, right? Misogyny is still huge, homophobia is still huge. And you now don't have the tools to raise the alarm when they when when you want to because people are not taking it as seriously as they used to. So this is the, the this is the tactic that the regressive left uses. They they're looking for ways to get offended. They're offense strategies, right? They constantly have people looking for ways online to be like, what's the next thing we're going to be offended about? So. The, and they come and they ruin these movements. Right? They ruin the movements, the movements that the the champions of enlightenment values, which were used to, uh, used to be mostly left wing leaning, they are they come and they ruin their branding and their mark and their appeal that they used to have to people. Like look at feminism now. I, I meet even feminists that, that they don't call themselves feminists anymore. They're like, oh, I'm a woman rights activist. Like, I don't call myself feminist anymore because, like, apparently that name is toxic now. And, like, what? I, some people would say, like, oh, I call myself a classical liberal. I don't call myself liberal anymore. And, like, can we not give up these labels? You know, we have made so many. Some people don't like labels. I love labels. Labels are like a flag that you use to find the people that are in your movement to, to identify, to find, to help each other find each other, right? And these are, these are the labels that have done so much good for so long, and as soon as they become a little toxic, we're like, oh, just get rid of it. No, but can we reclaim them, please? I'm not a classical liberal, I'm a fucking liberal. <laughs> But they come and they, they use this, you know, this of getting offended tactic, and they are addicted to become being offended. Like it, this is why they have to invade, invent races. But they have to invent races because there's not enough races for them to go around, right? They they, they dream of a world where the white supremacy is taking over because that makes them more relevant. But they, they and they come and they overuse it. They, so the things that they've been overused now: misogyny, accusations of misogyny, Islamophobia, bigotry, homophobia. So now, because these don't have the stinging power as they used to, they're moving to other things. They already ruined those, uh, uh, you know, those movements, and now they're moving to uh, things that still do have stinging power. And this is that the new, so, uh, the new method is to get offended and make accusations accusations of transphobia 
and anti being anti-Semitic. These are the two new battlegrounds, the two new red lines. Because a lot of people have wise enough over a baseless, baseless accusation of Islamophobia. That doesn't work. That, uh, that's so 2018, right? <laughs> but the, the problem is moving now, now that they're moving towards accusations of transphobia and um, being, you know, people, everybody being anti Semitic as, well, as soon as they say something um, against Judaism or Israel or anything like that, is that this is going to be very, these two are going to be very, very harmful to, especially to the trans rights movement and also to. Uh, atheist activism and secular activism in Israel <coughs> at a time that is now needed the most, right? So I had this, I had a friend in Vancouver, used to be a friend, that I was, I, I was arguing with him over the uh, trans issues, like or gender issues, and I was telling him that listen, I, I think gender is a spectrum, okay? I understand that it's mostly binary, but even if you have a little bit in the middle, that makes it a spectrum. Uh, but I'm willing to change my opinion, but I'm not a scientist, so I can't be sure about my position at all. I'm open to be changing my opinion. Um, I'm, I'm willing to change my opinion that gender is binary if, if I see scientific data that proves me wrong, right? And like, okay, that's transphobic, you're a, tra you're a bigot, because gender is, spec gender is a spectrum. I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm agreeing with you. I believe me and you are on the same side of this. I think gender is a spectrum. I'm like, yeah, no, but you said that you might change your opinion. Like, I said I change my opinion if science proves me wrong. I'm like, yeah, no, that's not good. I'm like, what the fuck? What do you? <laughs> like, even, even, I, even that was too Like, I have to, like, is that, isn't that dogma? Like, you want me to agree with you and say that nothing will prove me, and not, nothing is gonna change my opinion? But, I got into more trouble when it comes to a lot of, I don't know if you guys know rationality rules, he, he got into a lot of trouble recently because of his opinions over trans, um, uh, trans issues. But the worst case is recently, do you guys know ContraPoints? ContraPoints? Uh, ContraPoints is, she's a trans right activist and I, I, I love her videos. She has educated me about trans uh, gender issues more than most people. And she is, She's one of the most leading people when it comes to raising awareness about trans, trans issues, right? As I don't know of anybody else that has helped uh, the trans rights movement more than her. And she just recently said something that was a little bit offensive on Twitter to non-binary people. And she's been crucified on, on the internet. She's, been, she's now off Twitter, and after all that she's done, that she crossed and she's out. She's not accepted anymore, right? So sometimes I feel like maybe maybe we're, we're exaggerating. Maybe the situation is not that bad. But when I see somebody like her being driven out, they're like, no, this is not an exaggeration. It's pretty bad. When it comes to um, anti-Semitic accusations, right? So I don't know, recently I had a picture posted on Twitter. I'm not saying anybody here saw it. Um, I went to Berlin and I took a picture um, on top of a Holocaust memorial and I posted it. I don't know if some people are going to get offended, but whatever. But that got a lot of people angry. In fact, some people were trying to get these events canceled because of that picture. And people say, oh, it's disrespectful, it's offensive, it's in poor taste. I'm like, it's a memorial. I took a picture of the memorial. I'm like, no, you're on top of it, this is not good. Uh, like it's disrespectful to the victims, and I'm like, well, how is it? Tell me how. But well, it wasn't meant to be disrespectful, so it's not because it wasn't meant to be. They're like, no, it is. They're like, well, I took the picture, so if it's, it wasn't meant to be, that's all that matters. And I'm like, no. I, I, a lot of people, a lot of people on our side again were very angry with me. And I'm like, okay, listen, where is it? Show me the harm, because here's the thing: I'm not against all red lines, okay? I'm, again, I, I'm all for lines, but the lines that I want to draw is, long, is based on harm. The name of the game for me is when it comes to standards and morality and ethics is what? Find the harm. If you can't find the harm, your line is pointless. So when, this is why every time people draw a line, I ask them, why should I cross it? And if they, if they can't show me the harm, I'm like, okay, I'm crossing it. 
In fact, I'm crossing it specifically because you drew it, right? And you're not showing me the harm, so I'm crossing it. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to cross it as much as possible. So now I'm going to actually, every time I see a Holocaust Memorial, I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm going to post it up here, okay? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's important. Well, don't fucking look at it then, right? <laughs> but but I'm gonna I'm gonna get into more trouble when it comes to Judaism because this is this is like Islam people don't care anymore. You can shit on Islam all day and night and people like, yeah okay. But Judaism they got like they I'm going after religion more of when I was when I was I, I'm scared actually guys because this is a huge red line okay. I don't think you guys are gonna invite me next time because I'm getting more and more controversial. I I when this is how scared I was when I was in Warsaw they were giving me an award there and. They, I had to make a speech when I was accepting the award. And I w my last line was, Islam needs to die. Christianity needs to die. But then I thought, like, okay, what? Uh, <laughs> 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 like, this is getting me. So, I, so I, I played the trick. I was like, okay, Judaism, Hinduism, and Buddhism need to die. Because I didn't want to say, that one line, which I'm going to say now, Judaism is Sudan, okay? <laughs> I'm not afraid anymore. It's, it's a barbaric, backward, ancient religion that needs to die. And you know who agrees with me? Jewish people, okay? Because Jew people think this is hateful towards Jews. Like, how is it hateful towards Jews? Most Jewish people are atheists and secular. They don't agree with this nonsense, right? In fact, if anything, they're the, the main people in the, demographically, percentage wise, they seem to agree with this position the most. But the reason why this is so, such a good, you know, the reason why these offense junkies are now finding this such a powerful tool is because of the confusion when it comes to the words that we use, right? Imagine how much more convenient it would be for them and how much more difficult our job would have been with Islam if the word for Islam, or the word for Muslim and Arab was the same thing, right? That would make it so much more difficult for us to keep it comp ex explaining to people that this is not bigotry, this is not racism, we're talking about ideas, we're not talking about people, right? So we have this problem with Judaism because Jew, Jew the word Jew is, could be referring to uh, an ethnicity, culture, religion, and more recently, Israel is trying to also define it as a nationality, apparently. So that's a to make it even more difficult, especially for atheist activists, Jewish atheist activists living in Israel. Um, I actually, I went to Israel and I was trying to, I was, what I was trying to do is to get them, get atheist activists in Israel to do what people have been asking me for a very long time because a lot of times when, when you go to events, we have somebody come up to you and say like, listen, Listen, Armin, or listen, Ali. Um, I'm. I know Islam is fucking bullshit. Okay, you're all right, and I really want to support you. But I don't want to say that. I'm a white man. You know, it's racist if I say it. It's better. I want. I just promote your work. You're saying it. And I know. Well, that's that's racist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is racist. You're saying like you can't say something because of the color of your skin. That is racist. And that's racist against white people. Like, if something is bullshit, it's bullshit. You should be able to say it. You should be like, am I the right shade to be able to say this thing? <laughs> yeah, so, but now I'm doing that. I'm, I felt in Israel, I was like, I'm a, I'm a hypocrite because I was doing the same thing. Because I was like, I was looking for atheist Jews to say stuff against Judaism because I was afraid of saying it myself. So, <laughs> like, you guys say, like, I, I can't say this if you don't say I'm an anti Semite. But now I'm like, now I'm like, no, fuck that. I mean, here's here's the thing. Nobody will think this. I mean, nobody that I know of will think this is too controversial to say. White supremacy needs to die. Good, right? Now if I change that to any form of racial supremacy needs to die. Okay, okay it's pretty much the same. Okay. Jewish supremacy needs to die. Like, oh, okay, where are you going with this? Like, <laughs> yeah. Judaism is fine. Judaism is a religion that promotes Jewish supremacy as an ethnicity. It's, a, it's an ethno-religion, right? 
And the whole idea is that Jews are the chosen people, uh, that Torah, and if you go to town, it gets even worse. All of us, well, I don't know, if, not all of us, but most of us here will become slaves to the Jews one day, right? We're subhuman, right? And again, most Jewish people think this is bullshit. They don't believe in it. This is, I'm talking about scripture. I'm talking about an ideology. I'm not talking about a certain group of people. So as much if anybody is against white supremacy, if for all the reasons why somebody would be against white supremacy, they should also be against Judaism. It's pretty simple. I mean, and as they already said, I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry, I'm your anti Semite. They're like, wait, you were, where, did you, where did I lose you? Can you point out, <laughs> like, white supremacy, you were with me until the very end, and you're like, oh, you're anti Semite. Like, where, where, where was it that I lost you? And they can't point where, they, where I lost them. Yeah, but anyway, so this is why I'm going to be in so much hot water. This is why I'm moving to Philippines, because I don't think I will be able to survive it. <laughs> but, 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 okay, so how do we, how do we fight against all of this, right? How do we, so we have, and you know, values that we know work the most, and we have data that work the most, right? We have, uh, from the left, we have, you know, enlightenment, the most important enlightenment values being under attack, and, you know, at the, every single page of the Quran and the Bible is against is, is, is against enlightenment values. And right when we know they have been the historically, they've always been against enlightenment values. And they they're just pretending right now to be for free speech. They're they're for free. You're for free speech when you're not in control, when you're not in power, right? Uh, so when if you see a lot of advocates of right wing, uh, 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 advocates for free speech from right wing, I don't buy it. So we here in the middle of all of this, the, we need to create a base for supporting these ideas. These ideas that we know work. We've seen that they work, right? One way, so I have three different methods. Um, one of them is basically what I've been saying right now. Every time I see a red line and I don't see the point of the red line, I cross it. The problem is that a lot of times there's not that many of us crossing it. And this feels pretty lonely, right? And it's, <laughs> it becomes very controversial, but it wouldn't be controversial if the, so more of you guys also crossed it with us, right? And I remember when, when drawing Muhammad was very controversial, right? So many people say, well, look, Muslims are sensitive, don't draw Muhammad. And some people are like, yeah, we're going to turn it into an annual event now. <laughs> and, and now nobody's sensitive about that. Look, it worked. It works, right? Even Muslims are like, tell them like, oh, we're drawing Muhammad this year. And they're like, yeah. They used to burn, they used to burn embassies. Now they're like, yeah, whatever. So it works, right? Now they're saying burning Quran is offensive. And I'm like, okay, let's burn more Quran. Just don't be, do it safely, please. Like, I don't want anybody to like burn a house down. Like, oh, I don't mean, this is what you did. <laughs> But the next, so crossing red lines, cross, crossing baseless red lines is one method. The another method is we can't just be like, oh, the women rights activism is being hijacked and it's not the same anymore, or gay rights activism is turning to something else. And trans rights activism is so important because, oh, this is what I forgot to say, because the, the, what the, the tragedy when it comes to trans rights activism is that it was just getting started, right? Like, look at all the progress that we made with gay rights activism. Again, every time I say we made progress, people are like, well, you think homophobia is dead? No, but we have made a lot of progress, okay? And just in the past few years, the amount of progress that gay rights has made, nobody predicted that they would be getting this far by now, right? which is great. Uh, so it was, it, it was now trans rights turn to shine. It was their moment. All right? And they need more help because for gay rights it was a bit easier because the more gay people came out, the more you noticed that, oh, my father is gay, or my co-worker is gay, or my brother is gay, or this celebrity, or that athlete is gay. Like, okay, maybe it's not that big, you know, that big of a deal. The reason why it's a bit more challenging for, like a lot more challenging for Chinese people is because there's such a lower percentage of the population that it's, it's easier to normalize that. It's more difficult to normalize that to a high number of people. Right? So they need all the support that they can get. But the thing is that, unfortunately, their moment to shine was happened at the same time that the regressive leftist ideology started becoming more popular. 
And what you see now is that a lot of people, a lot of Generation Z people, which are the, our future, right, associate trans rights activism with this regressive ideology, you know, with the what the woke call the sector of social uh, justice. And, and I think that we, the people that are going to get hurt by that the most are trans people, right? You know, if if they had, a, you know, they they're missing out on the great success that gay people have. So. So we need to reclaim these. You know, the second method is to not just point them like, ah, oh, this feminism is now toxic now. Oh, like this is toxic. Oh, that's bullshit. It's all nonsense now. No, can you just do it the right way yourself, right? Reclaim feminism. Reclaim trans right activism. Don't just feel like it's bullshit. Do it the right way. Do trans right activism. If you think that's wrong, show people how it's done. So reclaiming these movements, not letting, you know, these are these are decades worth of work that so many people before have before us before us have done. We shouldn't be just letting them some some minor, you know small group of loud people take it away from us. So the third method, and this is experimental, <laughs> this is something that I'm thinking about and I'm trying to start, and I don't know if it's a good idea. Uh, a lot of people think I'm starting a new religion. <laughs> but so let me let me actually tell you why I think it's fine. So for, for a long time, when Atheist Republic is the world's largest online atheist group, right? And people come to us many times and they're like, you know, I'm a new atheist or I'm trying to become an atheist, considering being an atheist. But can you tell me like what do atheists do? Like what is where do we? What, what's the guide? What do we, how do I live my life? Give me a book or something. And I'm like, we don't have that. And it's like, you know, we, an example I used to give is like, imagine if I had insurance with this company and my house burns down. And I go to the insurance company and they're like, no, sorry. I'm like, what the fuck? And I realized that there was a scam. So, and then I get screwed over by them, right? And then my friend goes, and he's looking, shopping for insurance. And they pick the same insurance company, and I tell, I go to my friend, and I'm like, look, these, are, these people are a scam. They're not gonna pay up, don't go with them. And imagine if my friend comes to me and says, okay, well then you give me insurance. And I'm like, well, what? I, I'm not an insurance company, I don't have insurance. Go find it, I don't have insurance, I just know this is a scam. I'm like, no, you're telling me this is not insured, proper insurance? You give me insurance. Like, <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense. So I think, I feel like a lot of people, when they're coming to atheists and say, like, well, how do I live my life? What's the meaning of all of this? Give me, give me, give me purpose. Give me community. Give me that. And I'm like, no, we're just telling you that this is a scam. We don't have, those are the things you have to figure out on your own now. And that was my stand position, you know, my position for a very long time and my response. But then so many people kept on coming to us and like, well, maybe we have the data to know what works, right? I mean, given that this is the place where all the people that have given up on religion come, maybe we could be like, well, maybe have you considered in my values? We could, maybe we could do that, right? <laughs> this seems like the natural place to do that. And I was like, I kept on thinking about it, well, how we would how we would do this. And I was like, you know who does this kind of, this, the best religions, right? <laughs> right, because because what religions do well is marketing. They have good PR. What we don't, what we haven't done is that we haven't done good PR on some sort of values that work. And the reason why a lot of the people, act, the reason why I think we have sh shitty PR for enlightenment values, is because they work so well that you think that they just speak for themselves, right? You don't need to sell them because they just work. But the problem is that because we don't have PR, other people are claiming credit for the results, right? So it seems like we do need some PR, right? And we do need to find ways, how do we promote these values? And the problem is that a lot of us, the people in this room, they, the way that they come up to, come, came to their conclusions, they think this is something that works for the rest of the world, right? A lot of us are individualists, a lot of us are skeptics, a lot of us are, 
are not followers. We don't want to like, oh, don't follow people. Be, lead your own life. And we think that the rest of the world should be like that as well. You know, think for yourself. You know, don't follow. Um, but the, the problem is that most of the world is not like that. And they will never be like that. And we cannot expect to, you know, and this is something I didn't realize. I kept on wanting people to be like us. And we advocate for people to be like us. But, and you hear, you hear that a lot of people like, oh, when will people wise up? I hope, you know, and, but if I tell atheists now that if that's what you're waiting for, you're going to be waiting forever, right? That, it's just not going to happen. But I'm going to say something that is going to sound like an insult, okay? But it's not an insult, okay? And I will let, let you know why it's not an insult. Most people are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> But, but that's not an insult. I'll let you know why that's not an insult. When people, when people can't use their legs properly, we don't look down on them, right? We actually sympathize with them. We try to help them, right? When people can't use their eyes, when they're blind, right? We don't think they're less. We don't think that. We don't belittle them. We don't make fun of them. We try to help them. We think like, okay, they need, a, they need our help, they need our sympathy. But also when people can't use their mind like some of us, we think like, oh, they're, they're inferior, they're stupid, they don't deserve to be happy, they don't deserve this, you know. They don't, they're beneath us, they don't waste our time on. And then why? If some, if, if, so, if, when, when I say stupid, these are, these are people that probably need the most care, the most attention, the most sympathy, right? I mean, what's worse than not being able to, if you can't use your leg and you use your eye, that's, to me, it seems that less, less of a handicap than somebody that can't use logic properly, right? And, and the thing is that if we, if we keep setting intellectual types, right? They, the way that they try to change the world is by trying to come up with arguments and logical, um, you know, arguments for their positions and debates and you know fallacies and all that, which is great. And I do. We should be keep doing that. But the thing is that that's not going to work for most people. And we, if we keep wanting to, we can't try to find when we're doing activism. Our goal is not to make the world work for intellectuals. We want to make this planet work. For everyone, right? Including people that don't understand why we came up to the conclusions that we have. One example I have is I was talking to this woman and Christian woman and I asked her why does she believe in God? And she said, Because it says so in the Bible. And then I said, Well, why do you know the Bible is true? And she said, Well, because it comes from God. And I'm like, yeah, okay, most people here understand that that's circular reasoning and that doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> but I try to explain this to a very, very, you know, very friendly way, very patient. It took a long time and it was not successful. And I was really frustrated with myself. But like, how can I not explain such a simple concept to somebody? I came up with examples, I came up with a napkin example, but it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't work. And a napkin example, the napkin religion tells you that it's from God, so therefore it's good. But, <laughs> but, but it just didn't work. And at some point I gave up, and I just said to her, like, let's, okay, fine. Let's say you're right, I'm wrong, okay? Jesus is Lord, and I'm just not getting it. I don't understand, I, I don't, I'm not saying, I don't know why you're right, but maybe there's something wrong with my reasoning, and you're just seeing everything clearly and I'm not, okay? Do you think I deserve to burn in hell forever for that? And she said, no. I'm like, well, the Bible says I do. And she's like, yeah, I don't know. So she got it. I didn't have to explain anything, right? Right away. You know why? Because kindness, sympathy, sense of fairness, these are common. Intelligence is not common. But sympathy and kindness and fairness, these are common things. These are people that people understand. And I think there are certain things that we could you know, just like logic is a force for good, sympathy is also an analogy force for good. 
right? So it could appeal to other other ways. Other, we know we have determined that these values work. We have the data that shows these values work. So what do we use to promote these values to a higher number of people beyond just intellectuals, right? What do people need? If religion has done anything good for us, is that at least it has shown to us what do people want and what are they afraid of, right? We have thousands of years worth of history to know based on the survival of the strongest means that what resonates with people, right? They have, they have good marketing, they're selling bullshit with that marketing, but they still have good marketing, right? So we could use those marketing tools to sell something, a better product, right? And this is why people feel like, ah, oh, I'm in his own church now, it's a religion. Like, it's, <laughs> no, but it's not a religion if you don't believe in superstition or nonsense, right? You know, religion doesn't have a monopoly over community, they don't have a monopoly over charity, they don't have a monopoly over people getting together and coming up with interesting practice. Rituals, right? If you, if you have, if I don't need, I don't get it, okay? I don't need rituals. I don't need a sense of belonging into this community and a, a sense of identity based on, I don't need that, right? But what the mistake I made is because I felt like, because I don't need that, then other people should get over it. But guess what? If you guys don't need that, like me, you guys are the weirdos, okay? We here are the weirdos. We're not, <laughs> we're not normal, okay? Most people, this is hardwired somewhere in their brain, and they need those things, okay? So even though I don't get it, I don't, know why, I don't understand why people need these things, we need to give them rituals. We need to, if we want to sell enlightenment ideas to them, we need to come up with stories. You know, we need to give them heroes and villains, you know, and, and stories based on, not just the story of like, oh, we're a community because we got together and created this local chapter. No, they want, some, for, they want something old. They want stories that are ancient, right? Or maybe at least a bit old. And the, the, one good thing about enlightenment values is that we have good, a lot of history, right? We don't, it's not based on, you know, you know, not Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. We could go to Voltaire, we could go to Rousseau, we could go to Ibn Sina, we could go to Hayyam, right? We could co create these um, figures to, that people could look up to. And we could be like, you know what, we, we are, we're doing it the, the right way because our heroes were flawed. And you could point to their flaws and be like, oh, look, we're better than our religious. Because when they have saints and prophets, they see them as, you know, flawless. But we, we celebrate our heroes by also pointing out to their flaws. So we could even adjust them a little bit like that. We could come up with songs and art, and it's probably going to be very, very cringy at first, right? <laughs> and a lot of people are like, it's fine. We go through a cringy period until we figure it out. But we need those things. We need to. This is the last part. I don't know how long I've been going. But I don't know how. I, we need more creative people to figure out how we sell these ideas. You know, people with backgrounds in art and not like music and storytelling. But we need to find a way to do that because if we. The, the, the ideas that, we, that we're talking about. These are the ideas that have been responsible for bringing the highest number of people out of misery. These are the ideas that we need to show to people that if they have clean water right now, if they're not dying from disease, if they're living past 40, if they're not dying from childbirth, if they get to say things and somebody is not going to come and arrest them, if they have a gov government that doesn't have absolute power, that is some, some level of accountability, there are certain ideas that are responsible for these things. Yes. And we need to show them what these ideas were because they need to be, they need to understand that who and what they need to be thankful to. Because if we don't show them that, other peoples are claiming them and they're taking away these values from us. They're taking it away from us and that's scary. And we need to defend them. We need to become the guardian of, of these values before it's taken away from us. Yeah. Thank you very much to, to Armin Navabi for that presentation this evening. We're now going to do some uh, Q&A. And certainly, so I'm going to work my way from the back of the auditorium. So back people, get your questions ready, and, uh, and then I'll move my way toward the front, and then we'll be done. So um, anybody uh, near the back want to ask a question of Armin? Okay. Oh, sure. I think that's a very familiar face back there. Valerie's <laughs> me. So, uh, 
Say the question nice and loud, and I'll repeat it if necessary. Yeah, Arvind, how can you be, like, how do you manage being a um, Nazi and a Zionist at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult, and I actually can't do myself, yeah. I think, yeah, everybody else asked Yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So the question was, how, yeah, I actually do get accused of both of them being Zionists and also anti-Semitic on the set, sometimes on the same day, which is interesting. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, I'm here. So, Armin, as far as a lot of people, religion gives them purpose, right? Mm. Because it is that is belief, right? Mm. So that purpose has to come from within, like from within yourself. And if you don't have that purpose, I think this is why a lot of people have problems. And I think when you're suggesting enlightenment values and all this, there has to be a way of giving you know these people some sort of progress. But you know, how are we gonna how are we gonna do that? That's something that I do not know. Maybe you can have some idea. Right. Okay. So how could we give people purpose from these enlightenment values? Right. Well, I mean, this is something that I'm discovering one for, right? But when the, you know, so when you look at other, when you look at religion, and you know, when people find purpose, is usually by understanding, by giving, having the illusion of a source that is responsible for their happiness, that protects them, that gives them a community that they could be thankful to, and also that they could repay and um, show their thankfulness to. Right. So this works very well with enlightenment because every individual, every person in this room, for example. You, if you ask them about what they're, who they are, and, you know what, you could show them exactly how they benefited. You could show them why they're not in prison right now. You could show them why they managed to have two children and without much risk of dying, right? You could show them why they enjoy, why they're not hungry every day, right? And you could make a direct line between. The lives that you are enjoying today, and a lot of people don't even know that they have to be thankful for anything. A lot of people think life is shit, right? And if you show them that how much their lives are better today because of certain ideas, then even before being thankful to anybody, they might start even being thankful at all, right? Um, and show them how lucky they are, right? And you show them that, and they, you, you give me. I think you could give meaning by celebrating the ideas and the people that brought them here today, and maybe a lot of people would realize that for the first time, and also give them purpose by giving them something to do by defending and championing and fighting for the, these ideas, right? I think that would, not only that's a great source, if you manage to do that, you're, you're, you're hitting two birds with one stone, because not only you're providing a source of value to people, so a sense of purpose, you're also making the world a better place by creating more an army of people that are now advocating for enlightenment values, right? This is something that I am now considering to see if I could start right, with other people. So again, my answer might change a little bit next year, but this is what I'm actually thinking about almost every day. Questions? Yes, right here. Yeah. everything that comes out from religions, especially Islam, and then I started to uh, just uh, get easier over time, and, and then I changed over time. I, I, I can relate to you for, uh, for this story. My question is, we have three major religions, mm -hmm. the Abrahamic religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Judaism in particular is not a religion. It's a, it's a society, it's a religion, it's... it's mm -hmm. It's a nation, it's everything. Do you think that this is what makes it very difficult to, mm. uh, to, to present ideas against anti Semitism? Or right. Mm -hmm. Is it different because of that? Actually, it's not just Judaism, Hinduism is very much like that as well, right? And it's very interesting because there's, when I was in, in Israel, there's a huge debate between atheists that if they're still a Jew or not still a Jew, right? A lot of atheists in Israel are like, no, I'm an atheist, I'm an ex-Jew, I'm not a Jew, why do Muslims get to call themselves ex-Muslim when they leave religion, and I have to still be a Jew when I left religion? And then half of them are like, no, we're atheist Jews. What the hell is an ex-Jew? You're always a Jew, right? Um, and that's a very similar discussion among atheist Hindus, right? 
A lot of atheist Hindus are like, I'm an ex-Hindu atheist, and other Hindus are like, no, you're a Hindu atheist. So the reason why it's very similar is because these are ethno-religions, right? So before Christianity, more, all religions used to be for a certain group of people, right? You had the Persians had their religion, right? The Romans had their own religion, the Egyptians had their religion, the Hindus had their religion, the Persians had their own religion, and it was for religions were tied to a certain geography and to a certain ethnicity. Like people understood that, like if if you're a Roman soldier in Egypt. You didn't deny these other religions, you just thought these are not my gods, right? So a Roman soldier in Egypt would go around and ask, like, who do I pray to here? Because my gods can't hear me, my gods are back home. Who are, the go- who are the gods of this land? Like, if different lands have different gods. But what Judaism and Christianity did is that they divorced religion from two separate, two, two ideas. When, when Jews were exiled, right, to Babylon, right? They, the whole point of the exiles and moving people around is to destroy the, the do cultural genocide and like just destroy this, this, the, the identity. But the Jews were, I think, the first people that managed to keep their religion even though they were exiled by coming up with a very, very strict rules that everybody has to practice because this is how we separate ourselves from everybody else around them. And they managed to keep that identity even though they were, they were exiled. But because they, they kept their religion even though they were exiled from the land, by introducing this idea that we, we're going to take our God with us, right? So even though they were out of the land, they kept their religion, so that was the first time that the religion was divorced from a land. First global God, the God that lives everywhere, right? But even though they divorced the God from a land, they, it was, that God was still tied to its ethnicity, to a certain group of people. The Christians made that divorce complete, when Romans started becoming Christian, right? So Christian, Christianity used to be a Jewish cult that was meant for the Jews. But when Romans became Christian, all of a sudden then you had a religion that was divorced from, from both land and from people. It became the first universal religion that is meant from all people mm-hmm. everywhere. And then Islam followed that model. So that's its only two uh, truly universal religions. But all the religions that before Abrahamic religions mm-hmm. were for specific or at least before Christianity, were for specific race of people. And that's why, by the way, ethno-nationalists love pre-Abrahamic religions, right? Because it, religion is a very powerful marketing tool. And this is why you see a lot of white supremacists love Viking symbolism and ideology, because it's about, it was a religion of white people, right? This is why you see ethno-nationalists in Iran love Zoroastrianism, because it's a religion of a certain race, the Aryan religion. And this is why Hindu nationalists, uh, the idea of nationalism and re- uh, you know e- ethnic superiority and religion go all go hand in hand because Hinduism is an ethnic religion and so is Judaism, right? But that's the the, the answer to your question. This is why there's this is why they're different. Okay. Um, one of the things that's sort of lurking in the growth of um, atheism and free thought sort of the getting away from religion has been our uh, differences in our ideas. Is there anything do you think that we can do to sort of, and and I think that's divided the community, Mm -hmm. um, sort of the loose community that we have. Do you think there's anything that we can do to, um, you know, to sort of draw that community back in and get away from those differences being divisions. Well, yeah, by celebrating differences, I guess, by saying people, like, look, like one thing I tell people is, like, you know, gay rights movement, right? If you look at the gay rights movement and, and, and the success that they had, they, there wasn't that much that united gay people with each other other than being gay and, and the fact that they think being discriminating against gay people was wrong. You had right-wing gay people, left-wing people, you had atheist gay people, you had religious gay people, um, you had rich gay people, poor gay people, right? So, and they still managed to like, you know what, get a lot of shit done, even with all those, you know, divisions or disagreements. What what we need to do, it seems like right now, disagreements are becoming big, more and more divisive than they used to be. Like we need to basically, Instead of shying away from the cigarettes, this is one way some atheist communities try to tackle that is by look, listen, we're here for atheist activism. Do not discuss politics. Do not discuss this, do not discuss that. My solution 
relating to public so far has been the exact opposite. I, uh, let's highlight our disagreements so much so that you become desensitized to it because disagreements are not that big of a deal, right? Disagreements are just disagreements. I mean, one thing I tell atheists is like, look, we are, what are we asking the world when it comes to atheist rights activism, right? We're not de demanding the world to become atheists, right? What we're asking is for people to accept us as atheists. But not just accept us if we are silent. We want to be able to shit on your religion and you still have to accept us, right? Because it's not that big of an ask, by the way. Like, people are like, a lot of religious people are like, yeah, you know what, I like atheists. But the ones that are not insulting religion and the ones that are not, those are the atheists I keep getting along with, not you, not you guys. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's not a condition that we can accept. I mean, we are willing to accept you as friends and neighbors and whatever, even though you are promoting books that advocates for my torture, for, for my killing, for, you know, and I not only accept you, I even, if somebody wants you to limit your right to publish that book, I will fight on your side for your right to publish a book that says I should die, right? That's how far I'm willing to go. So it's not that much of an ask for you to get along to accept us while we shit on your religion. That's not that big of an ask, okay? Um, and this, but but the thing is that we, this is our this is our request for people to accept us, even though we have fundamental disagreements with them. Right? We're asking Muslims and Christians to just accept us as part of a society. Right? Even if they don't, even if they think we're absolutely ridiculous, right? So if we're asking them that, we need to, we need to do it to each other first, right? We cannot. I mean, I don't understand why, for example, anybody would be a Trump supporter, but I'm not going to kick Trump supporters out of our community, right? I'm not going to, be, you know, I, and I think that we, if we are not doing that to each other, if we're not accepting each other while we disagree with each other, how are we going to ask religious people to accept us while they're disagreeing with us? Right? By the way, this is not a unique problem because I think what you're, what you're noticing is mostly in you know, Western countries. But this is the same situation in other atheist communities. For example, in the Philippines, they have a, a, a maniac running the country. Uh, Duterte is... Um, is against, you know, he's killing drug dealers and drug users without any due process, no, no, uh, no court hearing, no, like there's so many innocent people have been killed in crossfires, and the guy is like, has violated so many human rights uh, norms that, and, and he has more than 90% approval rate, which is, which is insane. But he also is very much anti the Catholic Church, and Philippines is a very Catholic country. So a lot of atheists in Philippines, a lot of them, they're like, finally we have a leader that is standing up against the Catholic Church. And he's, he's, he's against the Catholic Church because he was modest when he was a child. But, but a lot of atheists like that. And some, uh, some other atheists are like, yeah, I'm an atheist, but I'm also a humanist. I can't support this guy. So you see a huge amount of division in the atheist community in Philippines, for example. So these are things that is, we can't avoid. Like a lot of people have come in and they say, like, oh my god, so much drama, I'm out. Like, but where are you going to go? If we are, any other activism you're going to do is going to also have, going to have drama. Like, what do you expect? In fact, if you don't have drama, it's probably because you haven't grown that much yet. As soon as your community grows enough, you're going to have internal divisions, you're going to have infighting, you're going to have drama. You cannot avoid it. Just come up with methods on how you're going to deal with it when they happen, instead of just quitting every time you see something. Any answer? Yes. I'm not a big fan of Sam Harris. <laughs> you're not? And I'm a little skeptical about these enlightenment values that seem to be the modern buzzword, because uh, they're really difficult to define. Um, are you saying that atheism is an enlightenment value? No, actually, the, uh, Voltaire, for example, and John Locke and the rest of them, they were actually, they didn't like atheism, right? Uh, they thought it was ridiculous for anybody to be atheist. But I, don't, I remember reading about Voltaire, was, he was writing against atheism, 
And there was this other atheist at his time that was so angry with his views, and he was writing an angry letter in response to Voltaire. But then another atheist at his time was responded to the first atheist and like, you know, you wouldn't even be able to publish a letter like this if it wasn't for Voltaire, right? So, no, atheism is not an enlightenment value, but atheism gets to exist because of enlightenment values. Perhaps. Uh, I'm also cognizant of the fact that back in the year 1000 or so, mm -hmm. the most enlightened cities probably on the planet were Cordoba and Baghdad, yes. which were very Islamic. Not very, not the well, but, but certainly they were not atheists. Yeah. So it's quite possible for enlightenment values to coexist with religion. Yeah, enlightenment values leave room for any values. That's the that's one of the main things of enlightenment values, right? Um, and also, by the way, so what, what is the what is the enlightenment value that you're building? Well, in in respect to what you're saying, for example, somebody like Voltaire hated Protestant Protestantism and Catholic. Right? But when when a whole bunch of Protestants were running away from Catholics and they were needed aid, Voltaire opened his door and hit them in his basement, even though for a lot of his life he was writing against them, right? So that is an enlightened value to for people to be able to have opinions and not be captured and tortured for it. That's one that's an enlightened value. For people no, freedom of expression. I mean, I can give you a list of the ideas that came out of Western, uh, France and UK that we consider them like the values, but one of them is freedom of expression, right? Another one of them is due process. Another one is the scientific method. The, the Enlightenment thinkers were champions of the scientific method. Another one is uh, holding, having limited go a government that is accountable to, to its people, right? So these are the certain ideas that came out of the Enlightenment, right? But also with regards to your opinion about Baghdad and uh, Baghdad was the center of science and philosophy uh, under an Islamic caliphate. But that has nothing to do with Islam. It was a center of, this is why when people say the golden age of Islam, I say it wasn't the golden age of Islam, it was the golden age of Arabs. Right? The golden age of Arabs, because... And Moors. Hmm? And Moors. And Persians. Yeah. And Persians. And the reason, because they weren't doing science because of Islam. Every empire that became rich at some point started doing started stopped doing war and killing and raping for some time and started doing philosophy, art, uh, and science. Even the Mongols start, at some point started like maybe we should. The Mongols were the most obsessed with killing and raping and destroying, right? And even they, at some point, they got big enough like hey, maybe we should start doing some science or poetry for a little while. I mean, <laughs> if the Mongols did it. But, but that, it's not, every empire has done that as, as, at, at some point when they got wealthy. It wasn't a function of Islam, right? So we, it, and in fact, a lot of them, a lot of them were very critical of Islam and the Quran, a lot of the thinkers at that time, right? Yeah. And actually, one thing, actually, I want to give credit to, um, you know, the, the philosophers and the scientists at that time in Baghdad, is that they, are responsible for the age of enlightenment in Europe because it was they were very obsessed with trans getting as much knowledge as every uh, from every corner of the world as it possibly come from China to 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 uh, ancient Europe and what they did is that they are the ones that translated uh, they reintroduced Europe to its past right because Europe had forgotten about uh, ancient Greek philosophers. And what they did is when Arab when they found these and they translated it, that's how it made its way back to Europe, which led to the Renaissance and what eventually led to the Enlightenment. So yeah, great difference. That's the point that, that that's worth remembering though. Everyone in the room should remember this that the Christians who claim that the modern enlightened world is due to Christianity. Oh forget yeah. about that history. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just totally ridiculous. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah, Cordova was even more famous. In, in, in Spain, yeah. than, than Baghdad as a source of the Which was a very... Tolerance was, was yes. remarkable. Yes, which is, a, which is one of the ideas that we celebrate, the tolerance. Yes. Right. I was going to say... Um, I'm not tolerant of everybody, so don't consider that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tolerance of ideas, not yet, yeah, right, go on. I'm sorry, I'm not yeah. No, no, sorry, sorry, I did that away. Tolerant of... Tolerant of people who are close to 
No, no, no. So okay. Let me clarify. I tol- by tolerance, I mean I will fight your right to express them while, while I fight the ideas. Right? I fight certain ideas, but at the same time, I'll fight for your right to say those ideas. That's, what, that's my version of tolerance. I don't like your ideas, I will fight them. I do not tolerate them. By tolerance, I mean you have every right to say it, even if it's the shittiest idea of the time. So go. Actually, I was just going to say that the reason why the, uh, those centers of learning open back up, whatnot, were there was because there were police at that time who were very liberal in their allowance of different other philosophies. There are no scholars who argue that it was a product of, uh, of an Islamic yeah, and worldview at the time. Show me how. There are well known scholars that argue otherwise as well. Yeah, because, yeah but, but. I'm just saying it's not a it's, it's yeah. not a cold issue. Yes, yes, but I, will, I, I know that there are people that say that, I just disagree with them. And I can't find a single Hadith or Quranic verse that suggests that. There's one Quranic verse that tells you to go like, but um, put that aside, everything else, a whole bunch of other verses and Hadith are to show that how that's, again, like I could, for, for that one verse that maybe encourages you to go find knowledge, I could find you a thousand verses and hadith scripture that is extremely intolerant. So if you're going to hang into that one verse, good luck with that. Good luck. I was going to say the tolerant, like when, like the good verses in the Quran mainly came from the Mecca period when, when Muhammad still didn't have a lot of political power. And right. he's trying to build his following. So that's where all these things about being tolerant came from. But in the Medina verses that cancels out the good stuff in the Mecca verses. Uh, and this Medina part of the Quran came after Muhammad had consolidated his base of power. And a lot of scholars in Islam also say that the Medina verses will cancel out the Mecca, the Mecca ones. That, does that right. make sense? Yeah. Uh, just, um, just as there are a lot of Christians today who do not hold to the literal truth of the Bible, yeah. I'm assuming that at, at that time, there were probably a great many Muslims who did not hold something. Like that. No. Yeah, but, but no, the Muslims. Yeah. No, okay, yeah, but they were the ones that argued that they didn't like religion at all. There were a lot of people that just a lot of a lot of, and this is where a lot of people did not know that under Bagbal, under Khalifa, there were people that were openly against uh, religion and they get and they were beheaded. So people didn't know that that's possible, but. Uh, more Muslims b- believe that the Quran is the direct word of God, right? And uh, there is there is not that much flexibility on that. I mean, technically, if you don't believe in that, you're not you're not a Muslim anymore, right? If you look, you could say something about Christians, but you know No, but this is the difference right now between Muslims and Christianity. Mm-hmm. Just yet, yeah, you could say that about Christianity and you would be wrong, and you say that about Muslims and you would be right. Okay? There are many Christians that don't believe that Jesus is the very word of God, but there are not Muslims that don't. Muslims, even Muslims that have never read, most Muslims have never read the Quran. Okay? Most Muslims have no idea what's in the Quran, and they would never try to even find out. But even, and, and they live lives that are, could, you wouldn't even know they're Muslim until they tell you, because they don't live Islamic lives. But if you ask them, if they're Muslim, if you ask them, is the word is, is the Quran the direct word of God? The answer is yes. You would have to be look really, really hard to find maybe I don't know. I don't have a met one yet. I think Ali has met one yet. Oh, but the face of the Quran is not the direct word of God? Okay. So you have found the friend the the tiniest of groups then. Yeah. Wait, let me you know, go with this guy, because you're, you're uh, yeah, go. Sure. Uh, before, you talked about uh, the story where you took a picture on top of the Holocaust monument, and you, when people got offended, you asked for a reason for the harm, mm. and it seemed like no one gave you a reason. Did anyone try to give you a logical reason, even if you disagree with it, as to why there was harm, or was it just the feeling of harm? Feeling, poor taste, disrespectful. I mean, I'm open to being proven wrong. Like I'm not, I've been proven wrong many times, right? And I said, oh yeah, I was wrong with that. So I'm open to be like, okay, yeah, you're right, this was wrong. But I didn't get any arguments. I was just like, this is, yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but, but you do feel disrespectful. 
No, because it wasn't meant to be disrespectful. I mean, they, they are saying it's disrespect, disres, disrespectful, but I took the picture, I posted it. So if they, I mean, they're saying it is, but I'm clarifying, you know, well, I'll let you know because I'm, I'm the one that posted it. It wasn't. And I think I've done a lot of things in the past that I didn't think were disrespectful, but others could miss me as they were. Well, if you were, then if you, but the intention was not to disrespect. My intention was not to disrespect. Right. Well, that's your feeling. I, I, in my, I look at the I said, but I said things and did things right. that I now regret because it hurt people's feelings. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that's that's something that I don't. Okay, so when it comes to hurting people's feelings, right? I don't try to hurt people's feelings for the sake of hurting people's feelings because that's sadistic, right? But when people try to when people try to use hurt feelings as a way to be to control dialogue, yeah. then I have to be like, sorry, I don't, you know, hurt. I have, I'm, you know, if 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 somebody comes and requests something, right, and be like, look, this is hurting my feeling. Can you please don't? And I'm like, I don't see any point. I will grant the request. But if somebody comes and demands something because their feelings are hurt, then unfortunately you have to do it more because you don't get to make demands like that. The example I make to Muslims, a lot of, for, a lot of Muslims come and tell me, like, listen, I mean, when you insult Prophet Muhammad, you have to understand that me as a Muslim, we as a Muslim, we love Muhammad more than our own mother. Okay? Imagine if somebody came and insulted your mother or made a cartoon about your mother. Wouldn't that hurt you? And I'm like, yeah, that would, that would hurt me, but but let me, your analogy is very interesting, but let me give you a better, let me fix your analogy a little bit, right? Let's say that, okay, if, if I was making jokes about your mother and you were hurt and you told me to please stop doing that, then maybe I would stop doing it. But imagine if your mother was a politician, okay? And your what the laws that she was passing was affecting all of us, right? And I'm making cartoons about it. Because I think, the, the, and you're getting hurt by it. But the thing is that you being hurt by it, your feelings being hurt by it, is a side effect. It's not the intentions, right? I'm trying. We're using comedy as a way and humor and ridicule as a way to bring attention to our bad policies. But let's take this example once and for Let's say your mom all of a sudden comes and she sees the cartoons, she doesn't like them, and she decides to now pa try to pass a law that makes it illegal for us to draw these cartoons. In that scenario. Not only I sh I'm drawing the cartoons, I'm going to try to get as many people as possible to start drawing them all, okay? Because we need to make sure that this doesn't work. We need to make sure that if there's any attempt to limit any form of expression, that needs to backfire a hundred times so that n nobody tries to use it as a tactic anymore, right? So that's why when people, when people use, they say, hurt feelings, Please don't do it, and I see the only point in doing it, like hurt feelings that support you. Because we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to make people uncomfortable for no reason. But if people like hurt feelings, shut this down, pack, change community centers, pass laws, hurt feelings, hurt feelings, it's like, okay, hurt feelings be damned, we have something more important that we're defending here right now. Yeah. Um, is that this is something I like to say, I don't know if you already mentioned it, but I, Jesus was crucified because he hurt a lot of people's feelings. When Muhammad was chased out of Mecca. Uh, he was, he was, these people were all blasphemers. They hurt feelings. The first feminist, the first LGBT rights activist, Harvey Milk was killed, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. All of these things, every major transformational change in history happened by people, was, was brought about by people who initially hurt a lot of people's feelings. Right. Uh, it's a really good thing that they didn't have Twitter back then. Right? So yeah. yeah, and in fact, Muhammad, when he broke idol, people like Muslims, when they got offended that I burned the Quran, and like, listen, Muhammad broke other people's idols. Like, he didn't even broke his own idol. He went and broke other people's idols. I'm burning my book. Like, in fact, blasphemy is sunnah. Blasphemy is the way of your prophet. You should be supporting it. <laughs> Richard, and then. Okay, thank you. Just a, I want to share one disappointing fact. I really don't know care. I'm not a scholar. Maybe that's why I'm disappointed. Yeah, this but Richard and I made the pilgrimage to, in Paris, 
So we saw Voltaire's tomb. Yeah. Maybe you've seen it. And so I was reading it, and I thought, well, here's Voltaire's tomb. And it's just something about contra the atheist, like against the atheist or something. Yes. So I asked my kid that was why is this? He said, Am I reading this correctly? Like he's against the atheist. Like I, because I, didn't, I don't have a full understanding of his writings and so on. I thought, what, what's that? But on his desk, I just want to share with you, on his tomb in Paris, on, it, it, it's quite a long uh, inscription, and so, but it describes his, his opposition to this and that, and I guess atheist. So it's right on his, it's a, I thought, found that a fascinating little tidbit I wanted to share with you, just so, it came up tonight. So that's a good thing, though. Excellent. I think that's a positive. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, did you finish? Well, I was going to have one quick joke, but. I no, no, go ahead. Please. Years ago, there was a TV skit, and you mentioned, you mentioned the works of my doctor, but, uh, about the Romans, you know, and it, there was some skit, something, if I can call it, a couple of Roman soldiers, the Romans had their you know, polytheistic, uh, all their gods, and, and one Roman soldier said to the other, oh, look, now, there's a Christian and there's a Jew. And they're looking down. Yeah, right. And guess what? They only believe in one God. And the other, right? and the other soldier said, Wow, you mean they're that close to being an atheist? <laughs> <laughs> With regards to Walter hating atheists, the reason why I think that's a good thing to keep pointing out is because. Just like Voltaire was against atheism, and yet he fought for everyone's rights to express. We want, first of all, a lot of the other Enlightenment uh, figures, like in the uh, family fathers, for example, of North America, they want slaves, right? And we, we're not going to shy away from that. We're going to mention, we're going to mention that. And I think this is the undogmatic way of celebrating certain people for the good that they've done. By we're undogmatic about it because we highlight the things that they got wrong and the things that they disagree with. But I think. Uh, celebrating somebody like Voltaire, even though he was anti-atheist, goes along, goes perfectly with his enlightened values of fighting for atheists, even though he didn't like us. So he fell for our rights to speak, even though he didn't like us, and we celebrate him and his expression, even though he's against us. I think it's exa- that's a very enlightening thing to do. Oh wait, oh. You, she was different. Yeah. Then let, and last one. Absolute freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. I, for instance, you know, uh, expressions that incite uh, violence. Yes. I think they should be restricted. So I, I know I'm mm-hmm. absolute in that sense. Um, but also, you know, I, I did see this photo okay. that that you had, and I read some of the comments and so on. And uh, had I not read it, I wouldn't have seen any reason to be offended either. Right. Until, uh, until I did see other ones. Um, so when you were saying tonight, you know, it's like if you, if, if, you know, you draw the line at this, okay, show me where the offense is. Or, or no. show, me, show me where the harm is. Harm. Right? Uh, yes. if, I can't remember exactly how you put that. Right. Um, I don't know that we could always measure the harm. Right. Right. Um, or the people can, can express, and I think sometimes um, you know people people can uh, that that their their reason for being offended is uh, is legitimate. If let's say for instance in, in this case it was it was the memorial and the memorial is a lot of really things to people. Right. Um, I was thinking of actually making a swing set randomly somewhere and putting a small sign somewhere saying this is the Holocaust Memorial and every time somebody gets on the swing set I jump out of the bushes and I'm like this is this is offensive don't get on the swing set this is a Holocaust Memorial but um, no but I mean okay so yeah there is some harm in people being offended but it's very little compared to the harm of limiting um, dialogue right 
I think we have to measure, again, it's very hard to do, right? But you have to see the net effect, and that's what I think. Yeah, people, it's not like people getting hurt is not important. The hurt feelings is still a form of harm, right? But I just think it's not, compared to other sources of harm, it's not that big of a deal. And if, if there is no other sources of harm, then avoiding even hurt feelings is a good thing to do. But in regards to the limit that you mentioned, um, I do I, I do have a mind which is inciting violence and also scams, right? Um, so, for example, if somebody comes and says, uh, "This will cure your cancer," right? And if it and sells it to you, if it doesn't, you can't be like, "What well, is freedom of speech? I can say whatever I want." Well, no, this is already covered under scam. Like this is already illegal because it's a scam. And I don't know when it comes to inciting violence. I don't know exactly where the mind is. So, for example, I think like if somebody says, "I think Armin should," it would be I would be happy if a group of people find our man and kill him, okay? I think that should be allowed, okay? I think, I'm not sure, but I think the line is, if they, if they say like, let's go out and kill our man, I think that, even if they haven't killed me yet, I think that direct concession of violence, I think that's the, that's the line, right? So I'm, I'm still not sure. For me, it would be before. Before? Uh, much, will no one rid me of this local atheist? Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> The U.S. at least is a pretty clear definition, um, and it falls under fighting words uh, as a term. So, yeah. an example is when um, the uh, South Park creators did that Muhammad episode, right? right? They had the cartoon Muhammad. Then um, there was a group in New York, a fundamentalist Islamic group, that threatened them on their website, and they posted a picture of Theo Van Gogh, who was who was stabbed to death in Amsterdam, um, and they said. You know, you should be careful because this kind of thing can happen to you. Mm. That that could be seen as a type of violence, but legally that wasn't considered a threat. A threat right. Would be saying that we're going to do this to you, and then showing them the picture. So yes, so there are, I think when it comes to where incitement to violence lines should be, there are people that have access to more data and information and what works best on what like what those lines should be. I just thought there is should be some line when it comes to inciting violence, and I think like. There are people that have thought about this a lot in much greater deal that probably could come up with a good idea of exactly where that line is. There was a woman uh, from Malaysia that announced that if there are any Muslims in Canada that have any honor, they would find me and kill me. So I don't know. Yeah, so that, there was that. Um, but I don't know if that's crossing the line or not. Um, would that be part of our experience or not? No, no, it said, no it is, she didn't say should. She said if there are any Muslims in Canada that have any honor, they would find me and they would kill me. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's a direct threat or not. No, but there needs to be some light somewhere. I uh, don't know where exactly. Like, uh, like when, the, when Trump got into power, David Attenborough said, someone said, well, how do you feel about Trump? He said it wouldn't be a bad idea if someone shot him. You know. Yeah. You know, like, who, who are they speaking to? Anybody who would be willing to go, oh, yeah, maybe that's the message for me. And then it kind of goes back to what you said in the beginning about, you know, being advised by Twitter that you had broken all these laws in Pakistan. Right. Somebody saying that in the Philippines to somebody in Canada. Right. What laws are being broken there? Yeah, but, laws? yeah, but we're not. Well, so when we're talking about the laws that would be a good idea for any country, even if you don't have it, right? So we're thinking if these laws should be not just U.S. Like Philippines should also introduce these laws, even though, or Pakistan should also introduce these laws. Probably they wouldn't, but it would work anywhere. So, uh, so after that, then. extending that gentleman's uh, sorry, I don't remember name, but how far are you willing to go with that? Accepting intolerant ideas because you know the paradox of the I don't accept intolerant ideas. I just because I fight for people's rights to say intolerant views doesn't mean I accept them that or I tolerate them, right? We should fight for the right for them to say it while we attack those ideas with no level of tolerance for them. not just intolerant ideas, even with 
Even not even anything that is not true, even harmless nonsense. Should I, again, I always say, if you allow harmless nonsense for that evidence, you're also opening the door to harmful nonsense for that evidence, right? If people even believe in palm reading, I don't tolerate that. that's not intolerant. That's not hateful to anybody. I don't tolerate that. That's, that the idea of palm reading, that idea needs to die as well. Okay, but I'm not going to go ban it. Um, you want? Uh, Armin, I'm, I'm so glad to meet you for the first time. Thanks for coming. Uh, my last question to you would be uh, about um, the side effects of atheism. Or uh, there, there must be a reason why Voltaire rejected atheism. I don't know that reason. Hmm. Uh, maybe one reason, maybe more. Uh, so let's. Uh, I don't have a God myself, but I'm just thinking. Um, like uh, I'm trying to be like that, the devil's advocate, like it. The, the, the believers or the what could be the reason that Voltaire has had the proposed uh, right. so, so my question my question is uh, in a different scenario let's imagine that another globe uh, where all the people are atheists uh, mm -hmm. would be any drawbacks or side effects on the community of uh, because in my opinion atheism is, is just like any other it's a philosophy like mm -hmm. a human philosophy like our or a human a set of beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, so it's not belief, but okay. Believing, believing that there is no God. No, that's not easy. Like rejecting all. No, not it's a lack of belief. Yeah, the lack of belief itself implies that's the argument. That's not my argument. It's okay. the argument of the believers, because I have talked to so many believers, and they always say the same thing. You are creating a new religion, and I said, no, I'm not creating a new religion. I'm just not believing in all of the religions, right. and they keep telling me the same thing. Russia, you are, are, are yeah. lacking a lack of belief or or uh, adopting the idea or enforcing the idea uh, for the for everybody not to believe in anything. Mm. This will imply not to believe in anything. I don't believe in God, but I believe in many things. I mean, I mean, uh, like the supernatural power. Right, okay. Right? So uh, asking everybody to not believe in a supernatural power uh, implies um, a, a totally different kind of, like, uh, how, you, how you live your life, like your lifestyle, your, everything will be changed. Mm. Right? Like, it will affect your life. It could and it could not. Yeah. Depends on the person. Atheism is nothing, nothing other than a lack of belief in God. It's not even that, it's not even making a claim. Part of the argument, uh, why why would a, would us be uh, following rules if there is no hell or heaven, uh, if there is no punishment or reward? Okay, so I, I I wrote a book on all of this, right? It's called Why There Is No God, and I have a, two different chapters on each one of those things. And if you want, I can send you a free PDF copy of that because this is a no, yeah, huge big, discussion. Big, but topic. but but yeah, it's a big topic. But one thing I want to say to religious people that keep saying, oh, you're just starting a new religion, one thing I do like to tell them, like, oh, so you're acknowledging religion is a bad thing, right? So <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> because we're on the same page if that's what you're thinking. Uh, but no, I mean, it, 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 is there any I, like that, I like that being an insult. That if, that's, if people want to keep insulting, like attacking us by calling us a religion, the idea of religion being a bad thing, that's good. Um, but but the, 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 when people call it a religion, when they say it's a religion, there's so many things that become a religion if that's the definition. I mean, um, so religion, based on, I, based on the professor that I took a uh, class of, is it has, it needs to have two elements, right? You need to have rituals and belief in something supernatural, right? If you don't have a belief in supernatural, there's not, it's not a religion. If a belief in supernatural by itself is not a religion if it doesn't have certain advanced rituals and stuff like that. Right, but that was the most simple definition I've seen, so I like it. I'm, I'm going with it. But then, but a lot of atheists even tell you that oh, you're starting a new religion because what? Because we're getting together, we're getting shit done. By the way, this is when we get together and do things. That's not part of atheism. That's just us, right? So one thing I say, for example, atheist active, atheist activism and atheism are two separate things, right? Atheism is a lack of belief in God. Atheist activism involves in fighting for the rights of atheists and fighting for a world where they're not discriminated against it, right? And I say based on that definition of atheist activism, you could be a Christian that is an atheist activist, right? As long as, just like you don't have to be gay to be a gay rights activist, 
You don't have to be an atheist to be an atheist or a secularist. You could be like, I'm a Muslim, I would, I, but I don't think it's fair for people to be attacked or targeted or mistreated because they're atheists. So you're a Christian and you're an atheist activist, right? You could be an atheist that is not an atheist activist. You could be like, I don't believe in God, so you're an atheist, but you might think there's no point. What's the point of doing all of this thing, right? Like, I'm not going to join any group. If I wanted to join groups, I would be in the church or something like that, right? So you could, you could, then you're an atheist that is not an atheist activist. So these, uh, that is not an atheist activist. So these are separate things, right? And if, so when they say, oh, you're turning this to a religion, they're not even talking about atheism. They're talking about your atheist activism. But even atheist activism, that's not even a religion because people that, are, religion doesn't have a monopoly over people getting together and getting shit done. Religion doesn't have a monopoly over people coming up with standards and ways of life that makes everything better. Religion doesn't have a monopoly over community. Religion, you know, why are we just giving this to religion and telling them the only these ideas? Like, well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm going to take it back. Right? But based on those standards, my, you know, my study group in college becomes a religion. Based on, like, if, if, any, if anybody, if people are trying to get something done, becomes a religion. Almost everything becomes a religion based on those standards. I, uh, can I say just a quick quote? Um, whenever people say that, I just kind of quote Bill Maher to them, and he said that saying atheism is a religion is like saying abstinence is a sex religion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there has been two versions of Islam, the Sunni and the Shia. And the main ones, yes. The, the two main uh, uh, versions. And I see Iran and Iraq, they have two political uh, Systems. And Iran, for example, had the theocracy and they have it for about 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And people have tried to uprise against this regime for several, several times, but they are still in the same situation. For Iraq, they have more liberal systems and they are still voting for the same corrupted religious leaders until now. Right. How do you see this? And if, is there any chance within the Shia version in particular? Because this is the most uh, controlling system in Islam. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they are going to get out of this system soon? Or it's very difficult? Well, I mean, this is why I believe in bottom-up activism rather than just top-down you know, approach, right? Because every time we try to change things in a society like that by changing the politicians or introducing democracy and stuff, if you haven't changed the hearts and minds of the people, you're still going to get theocrats running the country because that's what people want, right? Every time we let them, uh, every time we give them a little vote, like in Egypt also, they get the most of the right? It's not just Shia, I'm so sorry to do that as well. And, um, but, you know, you can see Reza Shah and Ataturk tried to do top-down secularism, right? So Reza Shah and Ataturk, they looked at Europe and they saw the fruits of the Enlightenment and they're like, we want, we want that, right? So. But they, what they tried to do, instead of, they, what they didn't realize is that what happened in Europe was that first people's minds changed, you had philosophers and thinkers, and those ideas became popular, and because those ideas became popular, then you started creating structures and institutions and top change as well. Reza Shah and Atatürk, they're like, let's force these ideas on the people, right? Let's just like, this is what women, not women. Reza Shah banned hijab in public. Iran went from, Within one generation, the people that were alive for both of these scenarios, the people that lived to see both of these, it, it, they lived in Iran and they went, they saw a country where the only country, Iran was the only country in the world where hijab was illegal in public. The only country in the world. And it went to a country, the only country in the world, now where hijab is mandatory for everybody, including for, foreigners and non-Muslims. Within one generation, that's not how big of a change you could see in one. Uh, but but it, well, part Islam made such a huge comeback in Iran, partly because forced secularism, partly because of the pushback against Westernization, right? Turkey, if you look at Turkey right now, it's becoming more and more Islamic. So you see the top down approach doesn't work. Right? Is it going to stay for a long time? Is it going to be like this for a while? I don't know. It's 40 don't years, four, four decades. Hmm. I, don't, have I don't know how to predict the future like that, but all I know is to try to make it shorter, right? And the way I think we can make it shorter is by 
reaching to the most religious. And also one concept I think that we can easily challenge in Iran, even among religious people that remain religious, is to challenge the idea of the Belayef Tabi. Again, I'm not trying to reform Islam and something, but Belayef Tabi, challenging the Belayef Tabi concept is an intellectually honest thing to do. It's a very short history, it just came out of nowhere, and most people in Iran don't know how short in history that concept is. And the entire regime rests upon that concept, and the whole authority of that regime rests upon that idea. So challenging that idea is, I think, in my opinion, is the fastest way of fighting that regime. Um, the Lai family's idea of the so so for most of history, uh, Sunnis were in power and Shias were oppressed, and the Shias um, the idea so Sunnis kept on winning wars and kept on building empires so that the, the Sunnis saw their their entire identity was based on we must be right because we were constantly winning all the time. How could God not be on our side? God must be on our side if we're winning so many battles, right? And the Shias they were always oppressed and they were always wrong and the leaders were always failed. And the Shia's identity was we, we must be on God's side because we're the oppressed, right? <laughs> God is on the side of the oppressed and the weak, right? So this, this was built within both of their identity until recently things flipped for both of them. After World War I, we had the last caliphs and the Sunnis, like, that was a shock, right? So they kept on saying that they're becoming weaker and weaker and weaker and the West is becoming stronger and stronger. So they had this struggle and like, have, what's happening to us? And when they lost that last time, that was a huge crisis in identity. So, so they had to come up with explanations for why this is happening to us. How could we be right if we're losing all the time, right? And the Shias had a crisis in identity in the 1970s and Islamic Revolution because all of a sudden they started winning and now they have the government. And they're like, wait, what the fuck? Why are we in power right now? In fact, their entire ideology was that we have to, we, she has, can't be in power until the Mehdi comes back. Until the 12th Imam comes back, we can't hold the government, we cannot be in power because we're she has. The, uh, the government will be for the Mehdi. So they had to, Khomeini borrowed this idea of Belayat Fadi from this other scholar, Shia scholar, right? and he came up with the idea of Belayat Fadi, which is the guardian of the uh, uh, jurist, right? I think that's the translation to English. But the idea is that we need to hold the government for the Mahdi in his absence. Yeah. 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 So I really like the idea of changing hearts and minds as a precursor to social change rather than yeah. right. if if you were to look at all the countries in the Middle East, which country do you think is the would would be the best country to, to Israel? Uh, Put our resources in oh. changing hearts and minds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean Islamic countries in the Middle East? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me let me let me. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me Iran. like Iran is a better bet than Saudi Arabia. Yes. Yes. yes that's the same bet. But and, and therefore, our foreign policy is totally misguided. Yeah. 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 <laughs> The only thing that makes me worried is that it seems like Saudi Arabia might need it even more, though, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's not there five. There's at least five percent, I think, atheists in Saudi Arabia, right? That's huge. I mean, like, is that at least five percent, right? Based yeah. On, well, based on the 2012 poll, five percent confirmed convinced atheists. That's huge for for a country that close and that isolated. Um, and I don't yeah, know. I think it's seven percent. Like there's a big number uh, over there. Right, and but that much of a risk to being an atheist? I mean, Saudi Arabia went beyond. So we have at least, I think, 13 countries where just being an atheist is punishable by death, right? But only one of these 13 countries went beyond just making it punishable by death, but declaring it an act of terror. So just being an atheist is terrorism in Saudi Arabia. So I think maybe we should keep focusing on Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, but by the way, when, when it comes to Iran, though, it, it, they, it does become a little bit extreme sometimes on the other side, right? Um, there was a hashtag that was being used in tw uh, on Twitter by Iranian, um, by a lot of Iranians, and the, the hashtag was a mullah for every tree. <laughs> and the idea was that, because a lot of people in Iran are, think that any day now, the Islamic Republic is going to fall. They just think that they're so 
optimistic, and I and I think I tell them like yes, be forty years of any, any day now. But their idea is that we'll, we'll get rid of this government pretty soon, maybe in one month, hopefully a week. But as soon as we get rid of the Islamic Republic, we need to go out into the streets, and there needs to be an imam hanging from every tree. That's how extreme it's getting for some of these people. These people are tired. It's really bad. It's really getting really extreme. So I'm trying to find the. There are a lot of humanists. There are a lot of people that don't endorse this. Another hashtag was Afun Koshi, which means killing mullahs. Like that hashtag was trending, um, and I and I posted the Persian tweet against that idea, and I lost a lot of my fan base in Iran because I was against killing mullahs. Uh, there was a poll that we posted in in Persian on Twitter. And then the poll was asking, what should we do with the mullahs once we take over the government? Should we kill all of them? Or should we just kill the leaders and the rest of them will go to mandatory labor forever? Do we kill their children? You know, because they have bad seed? And a lot of people think, a lot of people in Iran think that if you're a Muslim, you're a traitor to the country. Because, so it's not all rosy, you know, like, you have to be careful. Because a lot of, a lot of them think that the, Iran's, Iran's superior culture was destroyed by the barbaric Arabs, right? And that the Aryan race, which is Iran, yeah? So Iran means the land of Aryans, by the way. My name, Arban, means the guardian of the Aryan land. Because yeah. <laughs> we have my kids. <laughs> but they think that's... Please, <laughs> 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 oh, shit. No, they think that the Arabs are a barbaric race of people and the religion of Islam is fitting for such a barbaric race of people. And they came and destroyed the glorious Persian Empire, which is the only religion for such a, fitting for such a high race is Zoroastrianism. And anybody that is a Muslim is a traitor to the country. So these are ideas. I'm not just fighting against Islam and fighting in Iran. I'm fighting against other ideas and fighting in Iran as well. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah. If any. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, I get to talk to you all the time again. So, so I wanted to know, like, whenever we talk about these movements and you're talking about the trans movement, feminist movement, even the thing that you just said about Iran, anytime you have any kind of big change, there is some level of overcorrection yeah. that happens. Like, you know, the, the Me Too movement was long overdue. The movement yes. was being harassed for decades, centuries, and then something just happened, but there is a sort of a fringe element that became irrational, overcorrected for it. Right. Uh, same thing with feminist movements, same thing with the trans gay rights, everything. Yeah. Um, how do we, so I like what you said about, you know, you do the change yourself, and, but, but how do you sort of dig through and break through all of this discourse where everything seems like all ideas seem sort of similar, and um, really focus on the issue without saying, oh no, all feminism well, yeah, I mean, yeah, what you have to do is when you when you try to adjust over correction, you have to also make it clear that you're you're trying to fix, eliminate over correction, not because, not just because of the over correction, because over correction is usually fringe, yeah. right? But the over correction is not just harmful to the people that is targeting, but it's harmful to the entire movement as a whole, right? So, for example, if you see uh, Me Too, right, which is done a lot of good, right? It, it was doing a lot of good, it's still doing a lot of good because it was taking people seriously, taking a lot of people seriously that used to be ignored, right? And taking taking victims or potential victims seriously is always good. But then the next step that we shouldn't have crossed was just to believe everybody with that evidence, right? That was one extra step that we shouldn't have crossed. But the thing is that that extra step compared is, has its victims, and its victims are a small number compared to the people that it has saved. So some people are like, well, it's worth it because, yes, you're going to get some misfires, but who cares? It's helping more people. But first of all, no, uh, because we, we enlightenment, we believe in the right and like that, and we believe in due process, and we, we fight for that um, all across the board. But it's not just hurting the, the false victims. It's that small overcorrection is derailing the entire movement, right? And that is harming the entire movement. So even for the sake of the real victims, you should fix those over So you made that case. 
Um, but also you do it. Because most of the anti-social justice warriors, they're just pointing and calling things ridiculous. If you want to be effective against misuse of accusations of racism, then also point to racism and fight racism, right? If you think that some people are taking feminism to a place where it doesn't belong, that is doing a lot of harm, if you just don't say that, then also do the right form of feminism. Do it, do that as well, right? So to, to provide, to show, don't, don't just say, don't just tell, but that's, that's my solution. Does that, do you have any other advice on that? These are the things that I think. No, I, I think I, I would do the same thing. Right. I also think that, like, you know, when they had the Believe All Women thing, it was, it's a little uncomfortable because, you know, it feels right, you want to do it, because it's so long overdue. But it's, I think, yeah, take accusations seriously is a big step. And it's it doesn't problem. even feel right because it feels so patriarchal. No, it I mean, feels like... It, it feels it, right, I mean, like, it's not... Like it, it doesn't, because the best argument against Believe All Women is three words, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. <laughs> no, but, but the thing is that you're, it's like, it, even if you think this is a pro-woman thing to say, it's actually a very anti-woman thing to say. You think like women have to, don't have enough agency to lie, right? Like you don't think you're capable yeah, of it. Yes, in fact, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Secular Jihadists is an increasingly influential podcast with much of its growing audience in Muslim-majority countries, advocating for atheists, secularists, and Enlightenment thinkers. We want to reach out to more people. If we reach 500 patrons, we will be able to translate our shows into Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Bengali, Malay, Turkish, and other languages in these countries. Help us get there at patreon.com slash sjme.